do a lot of digging to pull any of the data. So the content of the IDB uh, primarily comes from PubMed, and then we do a query every two weeks for three new data that was recently published. And we also query PubMed for uh, the new structures of binding to epitopes. And then um, with our keyword query, we retrieve around 190,000 uh, references that were then classified by uh, automated classifiers that list the keywords and says if the rep manuscript is likely to be infectious disease out or down in the And then uh, from here, they're manually uh, scanned and curated. And of the papers, uh, roughly 70% actually end up in the database. And this is often because information is lacking. If you have a sequence or it's a review um, article, or there was actually no step data, just to see where it wasn't really. Yes. <clears throat> we're going to get to that. So every two weeks, we should ask, the question was how many references are added every two weeks, and it is a graph. Well, every week we add around uh, 15 to 20 new manuscripts to the website. And the number of episodes could be anywhere between 15 and 3,000, depending on what was in the publication. It ranges enormously. A paper could be only about one episode, or it could have pages and pages of episodes. We have eight months, it's really long. So, whatever is there, doesn't. So, the data is all of the episode data is entered manually by the team of us. And uh, Marcus is one of our curators, and we also have a we have a curator at uh, the Tennessee Supercomputer Center, who's a 3D structural expert. Marcus is a chemistry at Penny. And so the um, team reads the manuscript, finds the episode data, enters the episode data using a web application, and then uh, it's reviewed internally. And we have talk a little bit more in detail about. It. Process. So we have formal guidelines and Debbie will tell you how to read our guidelines if you ever want to read them. Very exciting. And then we also have, uh, we reach out to external immunological experts. The founding of the database, a lot of experts were involved to talk about what, how we should go about doing it. And every time we encounter something new or something new literature, experts, and part of the meta-analysis procedure, <coughs> experts are reached out to for each people to try and please people from all different fields to mine these data. And then the, the application that the curators actually use to enter the data has its own validation as you enter it. It compares fields and validates as you go. So this is the process. Um, you get the manuscripts, they're manually entered. Uh, once it's the, cur the initial curator is happy with what they've done, they submit it. And when they submit it, another round of validation is performed. And then uh, another curator will read everything again, and then the two will work together until they're uh, happy with the results. And then every week, the update about 50 to 20 new papers goes out to the website. And then, as uh, Dermot mentioned, we take submissions. So down again. <laughs> the submission process is similar to the creation process. There's a, a web application wizard that uh, helps the submitter go field by field to familiarize themselves with what our fields are, what the requirements are for the data. And it's very useful for if this is the first time you're submitting and, or if you just have a few episodes. We also have a large uh, spreadsheet uh, format for really large submissions, and that's for the recurring submitters tend to use that. And if anyone here is interested in submitting data, uh, Nima is the one we'll talk to later in the breakout session. And that uh, process is similar. The files are submitted by the user. Automated validation is also performed on them. And then uh, internally, a curator will review the data and make sure all of the fields make sense and looks consistent. And they will work with the submitter to make sure it's accurate. And then the submitter uh, defines the release date. And often it's because they want their submission to come out at the same time as the publication. So authors will publish a small set of epitopes where they study 3,000, they'll submit 3,000 and publish 10, and then we'll link two in our website so you can tell what the submission is done. Publication are related data sets, and we'll hold the submission until they're ready to come out publicly. So every two weeks, we do the new query, and this is the weekly update of so the 15 to 20 publications. 
And our current goal is to have at least 80% of the publication on the database published within six weeks of the time they were published. And we usually need to exceed that. And um, so the website, we do new features at least twice a year. And uh, validation rules are continually being reviewed and updated. And as Bjorn mentioned, the old data that was created many years ago, we always go back to it. If we add a new field or we add a validation, we go back to the old data. And we use any user feedback to identify anything unusual or maybe an error, an author might contact us if we missed something. We're happy to hear those types of feedback. So all of the data in the database is F specific. And the uh, majority are peptidic epitopes. And every peptidic epitope will have a linear amino acid sequence captured by standard capital letter. And you can blast match on the search. And if any of the residues were modified, we have a field captured each amino acid that was modified, what it's modified with. And um, the epitopes are given a protein source if they're natural and are derived from the protein. And we use genetic identifiers for this. If the author um, specifically mentions they used or parsed a specific genetic entry, we will keep that ID with their epitope. Most authors do not provide that, and so we use representative. Uh, any protein from GenBank that's 100% black matching to the epitope matches with the author's protein name and the protein organism. They said we will use the representative. And we have evidence posts that say that either the author provided the GenBank entry or it's a representative one, which means the curator found a good match. And then, as Sarah mentioned, all organisms we use in the taxonomy. If it's a non peptidic, non -peptidic epitope, a carbohydrate, a lipid, a metal, and drug, we ask markets to draw it for us because we can't enter senior amino acids. You know, to describe that. He reviews the paper, he looks at what the structure was. Sometimes he contacts authors to find out what it was really intended. And he gives our team back a KDI. We just hand it a KDI. If the uh, epitope, is derived from a larger structure, like the epitope is a small part of the LPS molecule, the LPS molecule would be the source. So it will also have a KB. The epitope itself will have its own KB, and then it's natural will have a PCBI. So the entirety of the ID is the database is the database of experiments or epitope specific. So um, as we said many times we describe the reference, every experiment comes from a reference. And so we have a set of fields that describe the reference itself. If you're interested in searching by the author's title, the journals, you're going to limit your data set. Based on anything particular of that ID, we uh, capture the year it was published, the page numbers, it's a full set. And then the immunization procedure that uh, Bjorn mentioned, how the host came to mount the lead response. We have a large set of fields that describe this entire process. Every host that's tested, we capture, we don't exclude any hosts. We use NCBI taxonomy to describe that, but we also capture their age and gender and their geolocation. Authors provide it. You can only to choose hosts from a certain part of the world. You can limit your search to that. Uh, we also capture uh, what they were exposed to or what they were injected with, which is immunogen. If it was an injection, we capture the procedure of that administration, the route, the dose, the adjuvant. All the, any detail that's in the manuscript is the searchable field. And then if it was a disease exposure, we use disease ontology to describe the disease and capture if it's acute or chronic or close. And the assay itself, which is the main point of the database, all the different experiments. The experiment type, we have a controlled vocabulary where we use the ontology of biomedical investigations, which is OB, it's ontology for experiment type. So all of our assays are presented in a hierarchical format, which Carrie Newman will talk more about later. And then here, we get to the question earlier. If the experiment was an antibody experiment, we have a set of fields to describe the antibody. The isotype, whether it's purified or not, whether it was serum, whether it's polyclonal or monoclonal, the name of the antibody. And these fields are as detailed as the paper was. And then if it's a T-cell experiment, we describe everything we can about the vector cells. Uh, what tissue they came from, whether they were purified CD4 cells, and whether they were feeding seeds. If they were re stimulated, we also described the re stimulation process. And a T cell experiment with a known MHC restriction is the MHC restriction is entered. 
or in every image to binding image to light solution. So that's the image we feel just filled out. And then the antigen of every assay, whether the T cell is anybody recognized the epic cell, a protein, a homologous protein from another organism, the organism, every antigen tested with that receptor is captured. And then we have a set of fields that uh, describe the 3D structure that link to the PubMed ID and this F sub viewer where you can visualize the interaction. And we capture calculated contacts and curated contacts. And if anyone who's particularly interested in 3D structure, uh, Debbie in the back, Julia who's rolling the back over there. They're the two to talk to and ask your questions to if you want to uh, leave them a breakout session and talk about uh, 3D structure. And this is my last slide. And it's to show you a summary of what the database is really about. The power of the database comes from bringing together all the different manuscripts and all the epitopes that have data. And to illustrate that in one manuscript, the same epitope may be tested, and then again in different manuscripts. The epitope, we gather as much data as we can, and once we have a huge data set, we can then perform all sorts of analyses on it. But we want to warn you that different experiments will have different results, and different uh, papers may use different hosts. They may use different antigens. They may use different experiment types. So you really need to uh, look at all the data and then narrow your results. That's narrow your query to what data you want to analyze and how you want to draw your own conclusions. And so here's an example of where this epitope is both positive and negative. By Liza, this one may be human and this one may be Or maybe this one the antigen. The epitope itself, but it didn't recognize the whole organism. You have to uh, really analyze the data later, which is why we debated this whole day into how you create a data and analyze the results for yourself. And the Amino browser that Julia will talk about is very useful because it will map all of the data that we have in our database based on the query parameters along the length of the Okay, I think that's me. Are there any questions? Can I talk to you? Thank you.